All right, we are here today with Scott Nixon of Happy Herbivore. How are you doing, Scott? Good, good. So we're going to dive right into these questions. Uh, can you give everybody a background of your career, your journey, and kind of how you started out and how you ended up where you are today and what you're doing? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I basically went to the, I went to the Citadel, the military school. I got a business degree, took some programming classes. Uh, after a little while later, I realized I wanted to do technical work, and I worked as a sysadmin for about 10, 11 years. Um, and decided while towards the end of that that I wanted to be a developer. Um, I worked as a developer for a, maybe about a year uh, before uh, I kind of kind of came on full time helping my wife. She had been kind of developing uh, her her product. Like she was she started off as a blogger for uh, probably about two years, um, and then started writing cookbooks. And um, about after she had actually finished writing her second book, she. Uh, we kind of found a new business or whatever. So my background was basically sysadmin to programmer and eventually to entrepreneur. But that was something I always really wanted to do was be an entrepreneur. So. Right on. So how long have you been focused exclusively on Happy Ever Before? Uh, six years. So um, it was it was approximately September, October when I started. Uh, so we're coming right up on that six-year mark now. So Right on. Okay, so... What's interesting to me is, you know, we all want to start out, hit the ground running and just have a SaaS app up that just immediately starts making money so we can quit our jobs and focus. Um, for y'all, it yeah. obviously wasn't the case. Um, you know, she started out very simple. Was it, was there a big game plan all along or was that just kind of a natural evolution that y'all let happen? And eventually you're like, I need to quit my job and just support this full time. And yeah, I mean, I, there definitely was, um, there was some rumblings of like Lindsay wanting to work for herself a little bit. She had, she went to law school, but you know, passed the bar, worked as a lawyer for a couple of years and wasn't really enjoying it. Um, and she had been blogging, um, you know, as she became, became vegetarian and then eventually vegan. Um, and she started creating eBooks, uh, just to, as a way to make a little extra money um, and, you know, uh, I, I think it was just kind of little by little. Um, and once she kind of built up some traction, I mean, this was, uh, a long time. This was many years ago. I'm trying to think, I want to say it was like 2009 when she started blogging. No, it was actually probably even before then. Um, probably 2008, 2007, something like that. And so there was a lot of, there was at least about a year of blogging, just kind of what she was doing, what she was making, um, uh, be before she was really even trying to like turn something into a business, so to speak. Um, uh, and then we moved again and then she kept writing. Uh, she, I think she had written like four eBooks uh, before she tried to get like a book deal. Um, and then they kind of rolled that, those four eBooks into a book. Um, and um, it was, it, 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 I don't know that there was kind of a plan to try to, to see where she could go with it, write books and stuff. Um, I don't know that she was ever thinking, oh, I'm going to create a business and I'm going to work with, with people or anything like that. Um, so, yeah. So what was, I guess, give a little background on kind of how uh, the site and the meal plans work and kind of the business model. And then um, kind of what was the, the aha moment that led from, uh, okay, books are great, but, you know, then with something like meal plans, you'd have recurring revenue. How did that come about? Yeah. Um, I, I think it, so. Uh, after she had finished writing her second cookbook, we were actually living in St. Martin in the Caribbean, and because I was working at like a French hotel there, and um, she had had a friend in New York where we had previously lived, and had her the friend paid her like a hundred dollars to write her like a custom meal plan, um, so that their friend had like a. Um, you know, some healthy meals, things that were easy to make, um, and something that could be done, you know, week in, week out, you know, for like a busy, this, this person that paid her was a lawyer. And so she was, you know, just, it was hard to like eat healthy and you know, you're mm -hmm. working all the time. And so there was a lot of complications to this and a lot of, you know, you have more money than you have time. So, um, and so that was like a little interesting thing. And, um, so we tried to do very, kind of simple little things where we created like, like a, 
like a, a PDF that was basically like, Hey, here, here are the five recipes you can make from Arc Lindsay's cookbook or from the website. Um, and as a way to kind of suggest things, and this didn't really necessarily take off, but Lizzie decided to try to like write, create her own meal plan where it was kind of like, here's the recipes for the week. And, um, I don't know if there was a shopping list from the beginning. Uh, I'd have to go back and look, but, uh, uh, she kind of put it together and was like, okay, we'll just see how this goes. And we kind of sat on it for maybe two or three months. Like I, I literally think we, she created it before we went to Europe for like a three week vacation, came back. And it was, I think it was about the last month we were living in St. Mark. We were there for a year and she just put it out there. We just, just to see how it went. And um, we sold over a thousand dollars that first week and we were like, wow, holy crap. Um, and now specifics, the thing to know about this is that she had already built up a decent sized audience. Mm-hmm. I, if we had a mailing list, I'm not sure if we even sent an email to announce it, but we put it up as a blog post. And, um, this was still pretty early in the days of, of social media. Um, you know, so Twitter and Facebook were just kind of getting going, but she had a pretty decent Twitter following. And, um, and so that was kind of an aha moment of like, we kind of translated needs and things that people had asked for into something. And, and, you know, it was a, it was kind of an experiment to put it out. Um, and once it, because there was so much money from that first week, like, wow, we got to keep doing this. And so every week since then we've released a meal plan on Wednesday. So, so, and I love how the, just the complete progression of it and almost, I mean, not quite accidental nature, but you know, you're just kind of floating ideas really. And one thing leads to another and it's a little bit based on people asking for things and kind of like, all right, let's give it a shot. And you try it and create a really rough way of doing it, get it out there, validate it. People are giving you money. You're like, all right, there's something here. So uh, yeah, I just, I love how things progress like that because all of us, yeah. And she was paying attention to the things people were asking for and people needed and kind of trying to, and starting to understand what people were struggling with. So, and I mean, back then, if you look today on the internet, there's probably over 50 services that you could find pretty easily that are selling meal plans, whether it's paleo or yeah. anything. Um, and back then, I, as far as I could tell, there was only maybe two or three other people doing meal plans, emails.com being the big, the big boy. So. Right on. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about the software progression of all of this. You started out as a PDF. Now I'm assuming there's a fairly robust system powering all of this and the subscriptions. Um, how did that evolve over time? Did you just initially built, just throw together something simple and it turned kind of turned into an application or, you know, where's it at now? Yeah. Where did it start? Yeah. I mean, so it started off just being a blog post. Like when we would announce each week, we were just announcing, Hey, here's this week's meal plan. And, um, I think at that point we already were smart enough to know to use something like eJunkie to, to make the payment mm-hmm. and delivery process really easy. And so it started with that. And then we created like a dedicated page on happy So it was more like kind of like a landing page, um, or a sales page, whatever you'd want to call it. And then, and then eventually we were like, well, maybe this needs to be kind of its own dedicated thing. And, and so we eventually created a separate website because what happened was we had started off with just like an, an individual plan. So it was meant to be just for one person to feed themselves for the week. And this was actually all meals for the week, breakfast, lunch, and dinner for seven days. Um, and eventually we added a family plan. Um, and so that kind of made things a little more complicated. Um, and whenever we, we, we created a, we, we bought a domain, getmealplans.com and decided to move that over. And, um, and eventually, you know, we were like, maybe we should have a blog on this. And, um, and then, you know, we decided that w- within the first year we knew that because we could watch revenue do this, because it was very much, you know, like every week you had to show up to buy and we were selling it for $5. And, um, and so it was a grind. Um, and it, it just made it very inconsistent. So it was like, wow, we got to try to do subscription. And, and, you know, this was like within the first six months of maybe Stripe being released. And you and I, believe it or not, had a conversation on the beach about Stripe. And I was like, yeah, I'm looking at it, thinking about it. This was at, um, at Lescom. Yeah, it was a long time um, ago. <laughs> yeah. And, um, this is back before you hurt yourself too. Yeah. So, 
was um, right and, before my surgery, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, and uh, so, you know, we, we started building that. Um, and the thing that, the way we have, have always run kind of the subscription is that, like, we basically send the person an email every Wednesday. And in that email, there's a link for them to download their plan. Because whenever you subscribe to something, you expect, like, if it's a weekly product, they, they expect, like, saying, here's your plan every week, right? And it, it, there's ways that you could do it, but I realized that, you know, the it, it was going to be – the best way to do this was to be able to write something custom where everybody got their own link, um, and I sent them an email, and it was much more reliable because, like, I didn't, like, you know, so much of, like – if you if you wanted to send something in Mailchimp, it had to be like the same link for everybody, and people could unsubscribe, and you know, and so there was some trickiness to that, and so I just felt like it needed to be custom. I mean, it's, to, to some extent, it's like you already have to manage the subscription, and all you're doing is just creating something that's very simple that sends them an email. So it wasn't that much like work, so to speak, to do it, um, and so that's what we did, and. And we actually still deliver that email every week. And it's because so the product that we're delivering is still just a PDF. We've just increased the, the, the beauty of it and the sophistication of, of how much thought and process goes into it. Um, you know, it, it, there's not a heavy tech component to it because we have, we've never seen that having an app was a essential part of our product, uh, what our product is, is basically helping people do something that's offline. Mm -hmm. So making it very tech heavy, we haven't seen a lot of value in that. Um, I mean, I think it's kind of everybody now, when they go to create some meal plan service now, everybody goes and creates an app because they think that's where the value gets delivered. And I don't, that's not been our experience. So Yeah. And that's, I think one of the, one of the reasons I was so excited to talk to you was, your business is not purely software. The software is just for managing your overhead to make life easier so y'all can focus on the business. So the software gets, otherwise, you know, obviously mailing out something manually or posting it to the blog manually once a week um, sounds simple enough, but quickly that gets tedious. You're on vacation or you're in the middle of nowhere and you don't have a connection or, you know, whatever it is, even if you set it up to pre-publish or whatever, it gets complicated. So building software to basically empower a business rather than building software as the business, because I feel like so many people I talk to, we're all looking for, uh, software businesses when in reality, there's plenty of information businesses or other types of businesses that don't have to revolve around. I'm buying a subscription to a CRUD based application and instead mm -hmm. getting something else of value. And the software just enables that business rather than is the business. Yeah. Um, is there, so that said, that's a kind of a perfect segue. Are there, have you, do you feel like there's any benefits to the fact that the, well, benefits or drawbacks for that matter, that the software isn't the business, but is more an enabler of the business? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the best part of having custom software in our case is really the ability to kind of, um, package and promote things in the way we want to do it. So, um, you know, selling annual plans has been a, has become a big part of our business, but, you know, being able to do things like offer installment plans on those annual plans, or you can split it up into three different charges or to, to do a um, member appreciation day. Um, th those little things have, have been really valuable because you can kind of, it, it does create a lot of work, but it's also you know, like if, if I talked about the amount of revenue associated with it, you'd be like, okay, yeah, it's worth the time. Right. Um, and that's what we have found is that it's worth, you know, having custom things to be able to do it just our way. Um, you know, it, it has made a significant difference. I mean, I think if we were like a, you know, a $200,000 revenue business, it probably would not be worth it. But, you know, like we have employees where we've, you know, we've been doing this for quite a while. So, um, I think there's a lot of value in doing custom software, especially even whenever your product is not a technology product. I think there's a business, there's, there's positives to being able to like package and 
you know, promote things just the way you want to do it. So, so it sounds too a lot like for the most part, it's really, um, it's not so much, I mean, there's an application component to it, but it's not so much a custom application as a really custom billing system that caters to the needs of your customers, whether that's through unique payment types or promotions, um, yeah. and that sort of thing. Uh, yeah. is there, is, so is the, is the evolution ongoing pretty constant or do you feel like y'all have kind of hit a point where it's like, we've got most of this handled, um, or their, their customer requests based on, Oh, it would be really great if we could, do this or, you know, are you getting a lot of feedback that's kind of driving the future of it or is it kind of settled into a steady state? So the core of the product and meal plans are always evolving and we're learning and making those better. I mean, that's a big part of what um, my wife and um, our key employee, uh, they're constantly working to make that better. Um, like they just released or they're just releasing tomorrow um, a new, it, it's kind of a redesign around like some information that they're kind of delivering or whatever, but I mean, there's just constantly improving of that aspect. Now the technology stuff, um, what, because there's this key thing where so much of the, like you could say like 90 plus percentage of the value is happening offline. Mm -hmm. Um, there, the, what we're doing with technology is we're trying to figure out more like, um, we're trying to figure out like measuring more of that, in, that offline engagement to basically understand um, what is making customers not get started or fail or not use our product. And so we're trying to use technology to, to engage them in some sense and, and get information back. So we haven't actually released it yet, but we're getting ready to. Um, uh, so right now, the only thing that we can really track is that they download their meal plans. Once they've downloaded their meal plans, we don't know if they've actually made any of their recipes or gone shopping or done any of that. And so what we're trying to do, if we basically learn from, so we have a very active private forums, remember? And one of the things that happens in those forums is customers come in there and are like, um, what are you guys excited about with this current week's meal plan? What recipes are you going to make? So they're literally looking to other members to see what they're going to make before they decide what they're going to make. And so what we're going to do is we're going to just have like a very simple poll with a list of recipes and they'll be able to select recipes from that poll. And then the idea is that we'll follow up a week later um, to, to, to get them to do a review. And so we're trying to measure excitement and then maybe measure engagement afterwards. Now, right now we're getting seven each week, 70% of our members download the meal plan. I imagine this number of people that will take the poll will be maybe like 50% or something like that. And the number of people that review is going to be a much smaller yeah. percentage of something like that. But at least we're going to start getting some amount of like knowledge of if people are using it. Yeah. Um, Cause right now we have no idea like what percentage of our user base is actually excited about recipes or making recipes. All we can see is whether they're downloading their plan. Um, so that's a very unique challenge to our business. So. That's, that's fascinating because so much of SaaS businesses and you see everybody talking about engagement, measuring engagement, are people using this feature or that feature? How are they using the feature? And, um, mm -hmm. you know, all of that, it's fascinating to think, how do you solve that problem in a situation where your product is offline, but you have mm -hmm. the custom software to enable that and explore some of those things. So I think that's fascinating that it's going beyond billing to finding creative ways to measure engagement with your customers and make sure, you know, what are people liking? And I mean, I would think you could probably even factor that back into future. Um, you know, here's the top, top recipes this week, everybody's favorites and that kind of thing to help people say, Oh, I should have made that. I didn't even think about it and everybody's liked it. Um, yeah. And so that becomes really interesting and further adds value and information for people who are thinking, um, you know, trying to stay healthier, make all these recipes. So, and being able to look at like the survey of like, I mean, we have, we have thousands of members, so we'll be able to like, it, it, you know, even if we have a fraction of them take this, mm -hmm. we'll be able to see really like in a very great way, like what's most popular. And then we can then use that information to make sure that it's in future meal plans. And, um, and we actually, I, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm actually going to make that survey available on like our sales page so people can see what everybody's excited about this week. And I think it'll, I think it potentially has, will help with the ability to, to sell the product as well, because they're like, oh, people are really excited about these recipes. Um, 
And I also think it's going it, to, it should have the effect where it should help, um, that social proof element should help push more people to make meals. I, you know, I have no idea what percentage of that's going to be, yeah. but um, even if it's one or two percent, that should you know help our business. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. So with something so offline centric, but still heavily dependent on software, do you feel like the software helps mitigate support um, or other you know customers reaching out for help for different things, or do you feel like it creates more because of technical issues or that sort of thing? Uh, um, no, I mean, I, I don't think, I don't think that, I don't know. That's a really tough question for me. If it, whether the, the technology helps them, I, I definitely, so the availability, the, the ease of being able to download it is probably the, the best aspect of it. And so I would say it's, it's positive for the most part. Yeah. Um, and the ability to be able to go in there and cancel and, and stuff like that, I think is a, is a positive, you know, cause we don't really hide, we don't hide it. It's pretty obvious. You come in, you log in and you hit my account and then you can cancel. And we do send you through a little bit of a kind of a survey kind of thing. But, um, uh, w- one of the things that we found is a huge portion of our customers come back and a lot of people, when they cancel, say, I- I'll come back in like a month or two. And so now we kind of send like a reminder, Hey, you want to come back and, I mean, this is unfortunately just the nature of yeah. a consumer product is is that people will sign up for a couple of months and leave and want to come back, especially in the summertime when people are traveling more and, mm-hmm. you know, out of their routine, you know. So. It's interesting. I had a lot of, uh, with, with Sifter, one of the questions I got a lot was people wanted to be able to pause their accounts. And uh, we explored the idea for a while, but the problem was people would just pause it instead of canceling. And then Mm -hmm. we're on the hook indefinitely for their data and all that kind of stuff. And so it was like, well, we can't really do that. And we toyed with the idea of things. We never got around to it before selling. But the idea of like, okay, you can pause for three months and then it'll auto restart. Because at some point, you know, there kind of needs to be a deadline. But with consumer stuff, it totally makes sense. Like you said, vacation or, I mean, just life changes happen, right? And budgeting might be generally going to be a lot tighter with personal stuff than it is with a business where you're like, all right, I see a return on this money. So I'm just going to keep spending it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So and it's very common. It's very common with like uh, yoga memberships, like our, yeah. we our yoga works. You can pause for a month or two months. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't know if other gyms, I've never seen other gyms do this, but I know our yoga studio does this. So, yeah. 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 Interesting. So yeah, there's, it's, there's so a lot more. It's like, it's like offline behavior that like translates to online. Like it's like a customer expectation that you should be able to do something like this. Yeah. So. Interesting. Yeah. So how much do y'all end up talking to customers, interviewing customers about kind of the software and that kind of, you know, usability or just research about what to work on or does that just come up naturally or do you set aside time for it? I mean, my wife and um, some of our employees are kind of constantly talking to to them because we have a really busy Facebook forums and we have very busy Mm -hmm. um, discourse forums. So there's constant discussion. Now, it's not, it's obviously not the same as doing a customer interview where you literally get one person on the phone and you go deep on it. Um, and so I, we are trying to do more of that. Um, I've done one in about the past, I've only done one in about the last two months, but I want to do more of it. And I'm trying to, um, one of the problems I had was trying to get the outreach aspect of it is about getting people on the phone and, um, that was a little more difficult. Um, yeah. And I think some people are shy and they don't want to talk about it, even yeah. though I'm not intending to record it or anything like that. I'm just sitting there writing stuff down. So mm-hmm. it's, it's been a little more difficult for us. And I think consumers maybe aren't as motivated to kind of give yeah. feedback. I mean, I, I do think people like to give feedback, but yeah. I think things like a free month of meal plans or whatever can help bridge that gap. I know with Sifter, one of, in hindsight, one of my biggest mistakes was letting myself believe that the amount of feedback I received via email was a good enough substitute for getting on the phone with people. And the reason for that was the big gap between email feedback and phone feedback is on, on the phone, somebody will mention something tiny that could take you five seconds to fix and make a huge difference for them, but they don't care about it enough to write an email. And so there's a lot of that serendipitous stuff that collectively you talk to people and you come up with the ideas and you're like, they never would have emailed about it, but they'll mention it casually on a call. And you're like, wait a minute, that's, yeah. that's huge. Like I could fix that real quick. 
And yeah, it's a little bit of friction and that little friction adds up, right? It so. is, it is amazing. The different types of feedback that a phone call or a face-to-face conversation will uncover versus, because we received a lot of, I would say half of our support requests were really just feature requests. And so I, to me, I said, that's enough that I don't, I don't need to talk to people. I'm getting feedback every day. But when mm-hmm. I get on the phone with people and talk to them, I was like, wow, that's a tiny little thing that's bothering you that I could fix. So uh, yeah, it's one of those things where it's tricky. You want to make time for it. It's hard. It's hard to, and I think yeah. in a way, because it's hard, that's why it's one of the more valuable things to kind of carve out time for. Um, yeah. And my thing is I don't have a system set up to yeah. do this and it's something I want to. And the, the problem is like, I need to just like work that out and I haven't done that. Well, and, and one of the best ways to do something like that, I mean, it's obviously going to vary for every business, but like at the third month of paying, send out an email that says, Hey, I'd love to talk to you in person, see how it goes. We just do this customer outreach research, um, you know, do that and we'll give you a free month, uh, just to yeah, chat with yeah. us on the phone, give us your feedback and thoughts and having it built into kind of that automated email stuff or just included on their invoice on their third month. Like if they've been with us three months, that type of thing, uh, enough people will reach out and say, yeah, I'd love to help. Uh, and that it's just kind of built into your process. So it's unavoidable rather than, Oh, I haven't talked to anybody in three months. I need to make time for that. That's a lot harder to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting way to approach it. I, I have to, I have to consider that whenever I go back to try to get this really yeah. kicking. So yeah. I mean, there's I think so I'll, many ways I think I'll have better. It. Yeah. I think I'll have better success whenever it's not summertime anymore. So yeah, that's true too. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. So overall, how has it grown? Have there been any particular plateaus that were tricky, uh, any marketing tactics? Because it's an offline product, does that complicate things? And how does that work? Yeah, it, um, it is definitely tricky, um, especially because we have high churn. Um, because, you know, every churn calculator out there will show you that, like, if your churn is this rate, you are eventually going to plateau. They can mathematically yep. show you a plateau. Yep. Um, so, yeah, it, it is a massive problem for us. Um, so I think the problem that we face is that we're so small that there's only so many things that you can do. And so I, I, so I took a class on, on, we'll just, I'll just call it growth hacking. They just call it growth. Um, but growth is a very, very serious and important thing that pretty much every business needs to like work on. The problem is that like one of the, key takeaways I've had from growth is that if you're not testing like really often now, now Sean Ellis says like, he talks like five tests a week, but like that would be impossible. And probably most one person now you can do really small tests, but like for the most part, like you just don't have enough time to like create those tests and then spend time to analyze them because it's just like, especially if you're one or two people, but I'm now trying to figure out how to incorporate more testing and then the review aspect. And so I've actually, so we redesigned the cancellation process. We redesigned the onboarding process and I'm getting ready to launch this whole review polling and review thing. And so as soon as I get this polling review out the door, I'm going to step back and then look at these other two things that have been churning for a couple of months. And um, I mean, that's the thing is that like, I need to be, I need to make significant changes and then I need to review what the impact of those changes are because you can't like like you might be able to make little changes on like landing pages or opt-in buttons and see some lift or whatever but you're gonna with marketing stuff you have to constantly change that stuff. but like you know like the uh, oh gosh what's his name Lars Lofgren from uh, I will teach you to be rich he's like you know, like your changes need to be really significant because how do you like, you know, if you don't make a significant change, like how do you know that that impact isn't just like noise? Arbitrary, Um, seasonal. And he's he's got some fantastic stuff on, like his rules on A-B testing are incredible um, because it's about like kind of setting up these like harsh parameters and like, you know, like most of your test, like something like 90% of your test should be just like inconclusive or a complete failure or you're not making big enough changes and stuff like that so that's my thing is that's my struggle with like fixing growth is being able to like make big enough changes make them fast enough and then learn fast enough and and that's the sean ellis takeaway is like if you're not learning fast enough you don't know like if the changes that you're making in your business are really having an effect and um that's that's the struggle for us and that's why like 
things like the onboarding cancellation and the reviews things are all around like retention and activation mm -hmm. because like that is like everything for us right now. Like my wife can go get and do a Facebook live video now. Like she could do one every day. She could do three a day and it would totally drive the number of sales that we get because we have a, a quarter million Facebook fans and, and it, it will drive sales. But the problem is that we, we don't have any problems getting new, new sales every month. What we have problems is that, you know, like, you know, it just, just constant churn. And so yeah. we need to be really focused on, um, that, that first hour, that first five minutes, that first day, that first week about getting them going. And so that's what I'm trying to yeah. figure out right now. And I'm using the growth hacking process where you're measuring all these steps and really trying to iterate on it. And it's just slow. So. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's the nature of a consumer business too. It's just going to be a little more yeah. fickle and fluctuation centric. Um, yeah. That's interesting. And, well, and I think at least in my experience, I'm talking to some people, I think one of the other challenges is a lot of people when they're getting started, they end up believing, okay, I could just AB test everything. But in the early days, you just don't have enough traffic or enough customers for any test to be conclusive. And I think everybody, especially developers, right? We all want to go to that because it's easy to just throw up some stuff, look at some numbers and make a decision. It's quantifiable. It's measurable. It feels good. But in the early days, like that doesn't work. You have to talk to people and make those decisions to grow a compelling enough product to where you have enough traffic, enough volume to where those tests actually give you data that's conclusive and useful. Um, mm. So it's, it's interesting to me uh, that... You know, it's not so black and white. Like everybody wants to buy into it, and it's not that easy in the early days. Um, yeah. I remember so many times with Sifter, it was like we just simply didn't get enough traffic, right? For a test to be conclusive, it would take months. Yeah. And so it was like, all right, well, that's useless. I need to just get on the phone and talk to people. Like, there's different ways. Yeah. The whole point is to find out what's going to make a difference to people. Yeah. And, and, and do you have an estimate how much time you were spending even on marketing and acquiring new customers? Man, with Sifter, it was so fragmented. Um, the short answer was probably not enough. If I remember, <laughs> was it um, less than 50%? Um, I would say for me, God, it just fluctuated so much when I was in feature mode yeah. marketing, you know, I, I very much stayed focused on one thing at a time. So I'd build a feature for a yeah. month or two and then I'd switch over to marketing for a month or two and then back and okay. forth. I, yeah. cause juggling it like week on a daily, weekly basis to me, that just killed my productivity. Cause I, my mind yeah, yeah, was switching absolutely. gears so much and, um, yeah. But that's what I would say. It's probably close to 50% for me with Sifter if you count like writing and a lot of that kind of stuff, but nowhere near enough. Yeah, so. yeah. And, and it's so much of like, I think that our issues, I don't think our issues are with our product as much as it is um, helping people get in maybe to, to the right mindset and just helping them like, get the right, like work on those habits, kind of get them kind of going a little bit, because I think that's the key that that's really screwing us. And, um, you know, I, that's just my, my inclination. It's like, you know, it, it, I do, I do see it as kind of a marketing, you know, product problem. So, yeah. So not to get too much into solution mode for y'all, cause that'll, that'll yeah. take us down a rabbit hole. But like, have y'all thought about doing, um, offline things so that when people sign up, for instance, uh, to the plan, you mail them a variety pack of glad packages for packaging up the meals so that they get it. And they're like, you know, then there's an extra level of like, all right, this step is done. Like I have to, you know, or find a way to where, um, you know, things like that, that kind of help provide that extra offline motivation to make it more real for them. Have y'all experimented with anything like that? Or? Um, so when we, it's interesting in the onboarding, um, we, the redesign onboarding, I did include a link there to a, a suggested containers. Um, at, at our monthly price point, there's, we would, it would have to be like some kind of an additive charge to make mm -hmm. that work. Um, and it's definitely something that's interesting and we should continue to like try more on those kinds of things. I guess the, like, um, it's like balancing logistics yeah. of, and, and also like, I don't know, it's a very tricky kind of thing. I plan to do, um, we actually have bought a lot of different containers and I plan to do like, just like this massive review of all these Ooh, different containers. Like wire cutter um, style review. of Yeah. And, 
and um, and they've done one actually, um, but like to try to like um, uh, try to like kind of help people because I think yeah. this is some of the stuff that really screws people up is like you just don't know because everybody could like one people you know some people's problem could be that like they don't have like a habit of shopping every week they have a habit of you know or getting chipotle or i don't know whatever um uh you know or they maybe they have the problem where like their kitchen's a mess and so they're stressed out in their kitchen so it's like an environmental issue or maybe it's like their cabinets are like disorganized and so it takes them three times as long to cook because they don't know where anything is and they've yeah. got their cabinets are stuffed full of stuff and so you just don't know which of those problems are and so the idea is that like so kathy sierra is obsessed with showing people like lots of high quality examples of like excellence and so that's what i'm hoping to do is and, and Lindsay does this with a lot of her videos where she's showing you her pantry and how organized it is. and so like you open up our cabinets like we basically don't have like a pantry. We have like cabinets and there's literally nine little like Ikea c- containers that you just mm-hmm. pull out and it has like jars of stuff. And so you just pull them out and they're all labeled. And so like, it's a, like we're showing them high quality organization and like the way that you make these things really easy and know where things are. And so it makes the whole cooking process like boom, 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 boom. So, so you have it's a, stuff like that. There's a whole interesting component of offline onboarding that you could help with that would help streamline this and remove some of that friction. That's completely outside of the application, but the application could probably help enable it or maybe it's content based. And, um, yeah. yeah, Well, I mean, what, 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 what is our, what is our, the way we eat is nothing. It's like in our lives are nothing but habits. And if you don't have those good eating habits or those good environmental habits, and if any habit book you read, they always talk about how big the environment is and, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and so that's a huge, huge component of it. And we just haven't figured out how to unlock that, the message in the right way to like yeah. get people and they got to fix all that stuff too. I mean, it's yeah. like, you know, like, Hey, you just bought the meal plan. Now go spend eight hours. Go invest in your cleaning kitchen. up your kitchen and buy all of this stuff. And yeah. Wow. That's to me, uh, that is a hefty challenge but to me it also seems like something that's exciting so when you get bored with the software side of things you can think through a lot more of the uh just the human nature of getting people engaged to actually commit and follow through yeah and so, so we're, we're we're focused we're trying our, our kind of our hope is to try to figure out a way to get everybody especially new people to make one recipe each week and Mm -hmm. if we can get them to make one recipe each week we're hoping we can kind of get that snowball building a little bit and kind of get them going so interesting okay um so we're kind of getting a little on the long side but um no i'm loving this so i've got a few more uh i want to focus on pains and troubles through all of this kind of what's been the most difficult challenge y'all faced growing the business um, and, or the, just the, the day that you were like, holy crap, what have we, what have we done? Um, um, I, I, to me, I think organizationally, um, delegation and hiring has been a big challenge for us. Um, uh, it, some of it is like not being, not wanting to let go. And then like the, the amount of like it's really hard when you see the amount of effort that's involved in like training somebody and getting somebody up to speed. And then, then maybe the quality is like yeah. 60% of what, you know, you were producing. And, um, and I, you know, so much of this is just detail oriented work. And I, you know, like I, it's just, it's just tricky. I mean, I, that's been a really hard thing for us. And at least for me, I've, there's a lot I've learned around being able to hire developers, customer support people. And, um, I have, I have spent more time hiring dele- delegated people, um, at least maybe in the sheer number of volume of people. Um, and so I've gotten a lot of good experience with that, but it, one of the things I would recommend everybody, like if you want to get help with something, start with something really, really small, like go to Upwork, put up a really, really small job and start with something really, really simple. Cause you can find fantastic people. If you start, if you make the thing you're trying to solve really small, because like if you try to go up there and have them, you want them to build like a whole website or like yeah. migrate you or like, 
just start with something easy. Like just make your life easier because it, it will make writing out what you want easier. It will make the entire like communication process easier. It might not feel like it's worth it, but that's how I have found really good people um, over and over again. It's just starting with something really small. That's really, really good advice. Del I think delegation is one of those things. Everybody starts out with uh, too high of expectations that it's just going to magically cut their time when in reality, yeah. the initial commitment to delegating is going to be significantly more effort on your part to yeah. communicate clearly and articulate what you expect and what you need and that sort of thing. And I think too often when you're so drowning in work, you're, oh, I'm going to delegate. I'm just going to hand this off yeah. and not have to deal with it. But it doesn't work that way. And then you can get disillusioned. You give up. You just keep piling on yeah. yourself. At some point, you have to break the cycle. And yeah that can be a really difficult thing to do. So taking baby steps towards breaking that cycle, I think is. In, in, in my opinion, if, if, you know, the easiest place to delegate first is in your personal life, because it's easy to hire maids. It's easier to hire, you know, you know, people to deliver yeah. groceries, uh, to cool yard work, all that, to hire that. Person. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's true. Start there. But then too, that's not a great proxy for delegation because you're not having to really tell them what to do because they know what to do. They know how to take care of a pool or to, yeah, yeah. to mow and I mean, lawn it, and that kind of thing. Yeah. And it, 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 the more that something fits into a box, the easier it is to delegate it. It's yeah. like, hey, developer, do this. Okay. Like, I mean, you might not like it. But like, it's still like, when people, when you, when the task is very clear in the, skills are very clear. It's so much easier. It's whenever things are really fuzzy. Customer support is usually very fuzzy. Yeah. You know, and it, so. Yeah. No, it takes time. But yeah, that's, I never succeeded at delegating. And I think I can look back now and easily see some of those places where I failed and why I failed. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's something I wish I had gotten better at. Um, so if you could go back to the beginning, so six years ago, and give yourself a heads up about the business in general, the software. Um, I mean, it could be as fundamental as how you set up accounts in the software or whatever uh, that you could change and it would have a significant impact on uh, your life these days. What would it be? This is a, a really difficult kind of thing for me. Um, I, you know, I think that... Um, if I had something to change, it would probably have been, um, it probably would have been to focus a lot more about being systematic with everything and really kind of documenting and getting help and, 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 and really focused on systems and being organized. Um, you know, uh, there's been, there's been a lot of, struggle around like project management in our organization. Um, and a lot of it is um, one of the things I, the number one thing that's kind of a pet peeve that I've learned is that people turn project management into like a dumping ground. And so they dump all their hopes and dreams into the project management thing. And then you like literally create, you like, you know, it's you, what was, I was trying to think of, uh, I can't get the phrase out. You declare bankruptcy and then you go start a new project, man, because all that one wasn't working for us. And so you go some new thing and then you do the same thing in that one. And, and I, yeah. I just, I, and I'm, in my opinion, you should have a very, very tightly focused project and you should manage them very, like, you should be very clear about like what's in there. And then if, and then you tell your people that like, you maintain some separate personal project management if you need that, but don't, and, but don't dump air, all your hopes and dreams into this project management tool. And yeah. I can't, I have, I've never run a separate, a software product. So I've never created like some big feature thing within some software management system, but I have to imagine that's what those things get like really gross, you know? And I know that was your product. Yep. So, or, uh, so, so in hindsight, I didn't realize until I sold Sifter, uh, all of the areas that could have benefited from documentation. Uh, but that was one of the biggest eye-opening experiences was my other mistake. And I could kind of factor this into automation was documenting all that stuff. Like when it's just you, you're like, yeah, I don't need to document this. It's in my head. I don't but that becomes a gating factor to delegation down the road. 
or seller yeah. or whatever. It was through the lens of selling that I noticed I really need to document all this because you know you're going to have to transition to a new team. And so, well, I've got to teach them. And so you end up having to go back and document all this stuff to make sure that transition is seamless and as painless as possible. And in doing that, I realized all of this documentation would have been useful for me over the years as well, especially when you're switching gears and changing projects and doing this and that. You circle back to it and you're like, what was I thinking here? Right? So it's simple you know, as, as code documentation and um, even process documentation, right? Like keeping your certain bits of information handy that you constantly end up needing, but you need them only like once a month. Um, and documenting all of those systems and processes uh, just makes life easier and it sets you up for that future delegation. So yeah, yeah. That, was, that was one of my big mistakes. So on the final note, so y'all are one more of a husband and wife team. I feel like I keep talking to people who and I'm like, it dawned on me the other day how many people I've talked to are husband wife teams. Um, is there any advice for people who may be scared of that idea or, uh, you know, cause it's probably not for everybody, but is there anything that has helped y'all, uh, work through that? Is it, you know, y'all obviously have very clear delegation or kind of separation of kind of what your areas are. Uh, yeah. yeah. has there been any challenges or things that you could, uh, you know, advice for other people who are considering that, but maybe kind of a little hesitant. Um, you know, it, you know, I think that if, because I, I, I think this is something that, that's like a massive struggle for us, and um, I, and I think I think being working very separately uh, helped make that a little easier. Um, uh, you know, I. Sorry, this is just a, this is kind of a difficult thing for me to answer. I have found recently that. Um, uh, creating space around the amount of time we spent together. Cause we've basically been together like 24 yeah. seven since I've been full time in the business. Um, uh, you know, and I think creating space, like leaving the house, you know, cause we work out of the house most of the time, but leaving the house and I actually just got an office. So, um, you know, creating more of that space makes that easier. And I also think it's good to like, like not to talk about work when it's not work hours, you know, so like we try to like not talk about work if it's not Monday through Friday, you know, nine to five or whatever. And, and, um, and, that, and goes, just, that happens naturally and easily, or is that a constant struggle? Um, I think it happens pretty easily. Um, we tend to, we've gotten better about compartmentalizing it. I mean, there was definitely way too much like working on nights and weekends yeah. over the years. Um, um, but, you know, I, I think that not talking about it all the time is good. That's a, a healthier thing to do. Um, you know, you know, it's important. Like if you like if you tend to be more of a workaholic, um, you know, you need you should probably reflect and try to find some hobbies or find some other healthy um, self-care things to do. Um, mm -hmm. Don't just because you have these things that you really want to get done, get done at work doesn't mean that you shouldn't be taking care of yourself and, and feeding other aspects of your life. Um, I think people with kids, it's probably a little easier to balance some of that stuff out, at least it, getting away from the work. Yeah. Um, but when you don't have kids, you know, you don't have anything that's kind of pulling you pulling away from you. work yeah. to like take care of the kids and put them to bed and read them a story and all that stuff. We don't have that. So um, yeah, I think having hobbies is a really underutilized thing. Uh, focus in people's lives. So. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. All right. Well, that's pretty much all I've got. Um, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate yeah, it. This awesome. is really, I think this is fascinating because it's a little less pure software and a little more balance of uh, how to make something work using software. So this is, I'm excited yeah. about this one. Cool, man. So, well, thank you very much. And yeah. one of the things, one of the final things I will say is like, um, you know, it, it, consumers have their own challenges, but you can grow a consumer business's revenue a lot quicker than yeah. you can grow business revenue. Obviously, it's going to be a lot smaller transaction level, but like, don't like a lot of people are very negative on on consumer businesses and stuff like that. And I, it, it has its challenges, but it, 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 you know, there's some there. Remember that it has challenges, but there has some massive upsides to it too. You know, consumers you think could have. Can you they, imagine Dr. Dre growing Beats headphones? 
to a billion dollars if it was like a business play yeah. about selling something else. I don't know. I mean, it just like you just you can just grow things so much faster. So. Consumers far outnumber businesses, right? So, yeah. you know, yeah, there's the challenges, but I definitely think it's something that everybody should give more consideration to. Um, it's just a different set of challenges really is, is what it is, I think. So but that's a yeah. really good point. <laughs> All right. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. I'm just at Citadel Grad on Twitter if anybody wants to come yeah, say hello. Yeah, I'll definitely link up all that stuff in the uh, in the show notes. Cool, man. Great. Right. Great to see you. Yeah, you too. Thanks. All right. Bye.